Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the University of Washington in Tacoma. Uh, my name is Joel Baker. I'm a professor of environmental science and science director for the Center for Urban Waters. And together with my colleague Melissa Malott from Citizens for Healthy Bay, we've organized this series of, of lectures surrounding the proposed methanol plant here in Tacoma. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your day, particularly such a nice day, to, to come spend some time with us. Um, for those of you who were here last time, welcome back. For those of you who weren't, um, welcome uh, for the first time. Uh, the overall goals of our, of our series are to provide a, a space, a neutral place, where we can come and discuss the underlying science of the, of the proposed methanol plant and the, the various questions that have been raised um, by the community and, and, and by others. Our approach has been to invite speakers who are selected for their expertise in the various topical areas that have been raised by the um, questions that have come to us from, from the community. Um, these, uh, the speakers are, are, are chosen and, and we're very glad that they, they came under these um, interesting times to, to share their views. Um, I wanna emphasize that they're here as experts um, in, in, in the technical aspects of, of, of this question. Um, they're not here representing their organizations and they're not here as either advocates or, or um, otherwise of the, uh, of the specific project. Um, this is the second of four events that we have scheduled for you. The, um, next week we will spend some time, same place, same, same room, addressing potential local environmental issues. Um, we have three speakers that will cover uh, things ranging, ranging from air quality to water quality to climate change. Um, and then in two weeks time we'll, we'll uh, wrap up the four the, the, with the fourth session and um, allow us a, a chance to reflect a little bit on what we've heard during the first three and to, and to think about some lessons learned and, and some, hopefully some next steps going forward um, in, in the science of this. So um, tonight our focus is on the, the potential use of natural resources by the proposed uh, methanol facility. Um, we have three speakers tonight, um, Bob Mack from Tacoma Public Utilities, Dan Kirshner from the Northwest Gas Association, and Eric DePlace from the Sightline Institute. Um, they, and they will cover issues related to water use, energy use, natural gas use, and um, in, uh, environmental issues related to uses of, of natural gas and, and uh, energy policies. Um, after that, they'll spend about 15, 20 minutes each. That should take us about an hour. We'll take a short break, and then we'll take questions um, Melissa Malat will um, do the Q&A as, as, as she did last week to all three of the speakers. Uh, we encourage questions. Um, there's cards to fill out. If you wish to ask a question, please do so. Um, we're going to do it a little bit differently this time. We'll have the, the uh, we do need to have the cards. So we have a written record of the questions. Melissa will ask your question. If you have a follow-up, then you can, you can uh, uh, ask a follow-up question. So that's the way we're going we're gonna to do that tonight. Um, and without any further ado, I would, um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Bob Mack from Tacoma Public Utilities. Bob. So if I wasn't here tonight, I'd probably be at UPS, because I live a block away, and I would have walked over for the uh, methanol presentation. Um, let me say some prefatory things. First of all, um, Tacoma Public Utilities uh, becomes involved at a certain stage in this uh, matter because we have uh, under the charter three of the city's utilities. The other ones are under the general government and two of them have been, their services have been raised as an issue in this plant and that's Tacoma Power and Tacoma Water. So at the beginning I want <coughs> I want to make clear that Tacoma Public Utilities has not taken and will not take a position on whether the proposed plant should be permitted uh, and if permitted um, uh, at that site or uh, uh, in some other configuration. We have uh, talked with the city of Tacoma and because we're part of the city, we would be part of an environmental review process and we had begun that with the city staff to address the issues that the city has sent on to me that were, that were covered in the scoping meetings dealing with water and power. Uh, we consider that because we're in, the, and this may not satisfy some people here, so I, this may, you may be dissatisfied by my talk. We consider because we're in the environmental review part of this, that we are limited in a way about giving any final determinations on some of the issues about the plant. And so my intent tonight is to just give you some background 
or this evening, some background about the regulatory and statutory background that we operate under for water and power. Uh, I've had a lot of statements sent to me. I uh, had an irate gentleman on the phone the other day um, who had some of the facts right and others not. I think there's been, um, there may not be an understanding about our role and, and the requirements we have to work under. And frankly, I've been educating myself the last few weeks on some of this and I've learned, I've learned quite a bit. Uh, and so I'm not here to give arguments for or against the plan, and I should also add, because I'm on the board of an organization that's going to do a letter on the plant, I also am not here to represent any of the organizations I'm on the board of. And I'm not representing the uh, position of any of our board members at Tacoma Public Utilities. <coughs> I'm going to give just a short interview. Uh, um, Review, and then at the end, I'm going to give some factual bases on current usages um, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a 35,000 foot level of power and water, including in the, what we call the Tide Flats area when I grew up here, or now calling the Tacoma Industrial Area, and uh, just some comparisons so people have an idea. By the way, some of the numbers that were put forward even to us originally for water usage and power usage have been changed as the application was refined. And so uh, we, have, we have had to provide analysis for uh, volumes of water, for example, that we are now told would not be used by the plant. And so there's been, so some people who may be accused of putting up misinformation, I think correctly relied on earlier information, but it's changed. So as far as the legal and regulatory background for power, um, the state requires um, <clears throat> uh, power utilities of uh, certain size, and we're in that size, to uh, do um, every two years an integrated resource plan, which has to be uh, aired at a public hearing and then adopted by our board. Um, and we do that every two years, and it plans for a two-year horizon and a 10-year horizon. The most recent one was done last year. I have a copy of it here. If you want to go to our website, you can obtain it on the website. I think it's 40 plus pages. It has a very short discussion on large, new large loads. I'm not going to suggest it has any deep, because this was not considered at the time that what they call an IRP was adopted. So it discusses our current portfolio, what, they, what the power people call our portfolio, which is our inventory of power, existing power, and then what would be done if a new large load is proposed, and it has a discussion of various ways of obtaining additional power. We're required to do this under state law, as all the utilities are. By the way, power serves um, approximately a population of 350,000 people in Tacoma and various suburban communities. Um, and this will come up later, by the way, and uh, the mil uh, joint base lewis McCord. Water is also under two different planning requirements under state law. And you can, I think, I'm not sure you can get these plans on the um, website, but I think you can get a summary of them, and the Department of Health has them. But where first we plan under um, RCW is the Revised Code of Washington, and the Department of Health has had authority over what they call Class A systems, which are the larger systems, for some time. And the Class A systems are supposed to do water supply plans every six years. Describe their service area, their supply, um, any future needs, uh, growth in supply. Our plan was adopted longer than six years ago. The state, for various reasons, mostly budgetary, has suspended the six-year requirement. And our next plan will be done, I'm told, in 2018. Furthermore, there's another statute, the, coordinate, the Coordinated Water Supply Service Area statute, it's a long name, which requires um, where you have uh, issues of water service that a county adopt a coordinated water system supply plan, and it basically delineates service areas for utilities and describes their water resources. So Tacoma has gone through that, and um, the uh, county has adopted our service area. Uh, as, a, as an aside, and it's pro probably not totally relevant, or I don't know if it's relevant at all, but I, at least I remembered it, to, the, uh, to our second supply project water permit, Tacoma Water Service Area for the second supply 
permit, which I'll get into later, is basically most of Pierce County on this side of the Narrows and almost uh, in the entire uh, King County because there was an assumption at the time that, that Tacoma and Seattle might intertie their water supplies. So Tacoma has, so water, I've seen arguments that we have not done planning. We clearly have not contemplated in the plans certain large uses, but there, the planning has been done by the utilities. It's required under state law. Now the next thing is one that actually I wasn't totally familiar with, I had to be reminded of, and this does change the debate for us. <clears throat> There's a statute that was first adopted in 1911. I actually, I might read the statute to you. And it requires um, wastewater service companies, water companies, electric companies, and I'm trying to think of the other one, gas companies, to provide service to any customer within its service area who requests service. Now there are some exceptions for water because you can think of if, if your water rights aren't complete enough, you have a problem. But let me read it to you because it does, it's relevant to the debate on, on how we fit into this. The statute says every gas company, electric company, wastewater company, or water company engaged in the sale distribution of that utility shall upon reasonable notice furnish to all persons and corporations who apply therefore and be reasonably entitled thereto suitable facilities for furnishing and furnish all available utilities except that a water company may not furnish water contrary to the provisions of water system plans adopted under and then there's a reference to the stu two statutes I mentioned so the service has to be um, consistent with the plans. If you deny service or do not provide facilities for the service, it's considered a gross misdemeanor, and the utility and the thank you and the officers in the utility are subject to a daily penalty. Clearly, there are limitations. If someone asks for water service in an area where the there's a case that came out of Yelm a few years ago where this happened where they asked for water service and the city did not have adequate rights, they can't comply with this clearly. But in our cases, I'll show, we do have at least a normal precipitation years adequate rights. So this, um, this is something actually I had forgotten about. And our obligation then is with, within reasonable limits to provide service to any um, one within our service area who requests water and power. Now we'll get, I'll talk a little bit later about the details of that. There have been questions about, um, I know I've had questions about um, if this plant were allowed, um, what would be the rates charged for power and water? Would the rates adversely affect, would they be the same as charged for other customers? Would they adversely affect existing customers? I'm gonna cite you to um, some documents. I have some of these, some of these are online. The first two are the Tacoma Municipal Code. That is online if you wanna to go to the city website. And I've cited the um, provision on electric energy and the provision on water. And I, I'll just tell you a few things from that. So the provision on electric energy says that in providing certain large customers the utility may include the possibility of a contract for industrial service and thereby a rate agreed on in the contract, which would have to be approved by the board and the city council. And we have a contract existing with uh, what, used, what, what I call Simpson, because I grew up in the city, but is West Rock now because of its size. It's all, it has, I think, traditionally had a special contract with a rate approved by the council after a public hearing. And traditionally in this community, when we had a lot of more industries and manufacturers, we had more separate contracts. As far as I know, the only two we have for power now are, and I may be wrong, are West Rock and the military base, Joint Base lewis McCord. Um, for water, um, the if you want to look at Tacoma Municipal Section 12.10.150, it refers to interruption of service. Under what basis? the utility can interrupt service. In other words, stop service to a particular customer. 
uh, it, set, it requires a resp um, response plan, uh, shortage response plan, which in fact we, was adopted uh, 11 years ago. And uh, it also refers to the possibility of special contracts for certain large users. With, with regard to water rates and regulations, um, I'm going to quote from the uh, water, uh, water rates and regulations document adopted by the City Council. It says rates should, quote, reflect the cost of supplying, supplying services to that class. So this plant, we, we have made no de determination. It would be discussed during the environmental review period. This, this plant would either come under the large industrial class that we have or a separate class. And we have created separate classes for very large users. And I can't tell you how that would come out, but the idea is that the cost of supplying an additional customer would not cause, in practice, an increase in anyone else's rates. But I'll get to that in a second. Uh, and then there's set out in that a policy on large users, especially for water. And then the water shortage response plan, which was used this last year, and I'll get into that a little bit, uh, has a definition of water, water um, shortages uh, when the, when the uh, parts of the plan kick into effect. So this is unlike some of the presentations I went to last year on the Click Network. No one's thrown anything yet at the stage. Uh, so I'll take that as a positive. Um, before I get into the historical uses, um, and I don't want to bore everyone, but the, wa the whole water uh, rights and water use seems to be a big topic. So let me just generally say that um, Generally in this state, you're allowed to use, the, first of all, we have a question, maybe I'm jumping the gun on the question, about who owns the water in the city system. Technically, legally, all of the water in the state is owned by the state of Washington as um, uh, in custody for the people of the state of Washington. And the, and the state basically acts as a sovereign in the same way that monarchs in Europe used to act as a sovereign in charge of natural resources. You get carryovers, carries overs of this law in how we treat wildlife in this state, which is, you know, no one owns birds, but the state, and no one owns fish, except tribes may have some claims, but the, the state serves in a sort of a trustee role. Same with water. So the only way you can, no one owns any water other than the people of the state of Washington. When people say, I own a water right, or I own the use, what they own is a right to the use of that water. And it makes sense, because if there's a stream running across this, between the time I started talking and now, the molecules in that stream would have left the room. So you can't have a right to that, to that property, because it's gone, it's evanescent. So you have a right to the use. In Washington State, you could claim a right to the use before 1917 under a claim statute, and Tacoma did, on the Green River, claim 400 cubic feet per second. Never used 400 cubic feet per second, but claimed it, and that was in 1913, I believe. In 1917, maybe I'm boring everyone, but this, this is the part I know best. So in 1917, the state passes the Surface Water um, uh, Act, and after 1917, you can only establish a right to water in certain, uh, with the certain exceptions, by applying for a permit with the state of Washington, now the Department of Ecology. Then it was a supervisor of hydraulics. And you're issued a permit, and then if you make the proper use, you're issued a certificate. Tacoma did that for the second supply line, which you may heard, have heard of, which carries more of the water now from the river. So Tacoma has um, uh, water rights pre-1917 on the Green River, post-1917 on the Green River, also rights to groundwater uh, in, in uh, groundwater fields adjoining the Green River, probably in hydraulic continuity, but we have well fields there. Plus, I don't know how many people grew up here. We, if you drive through South Tacoma, along South Tacoma Way, uh, you can see various, sometimes if you look over, you'll see uh, well number, whatever, well number, whatever. Tacoma owns water rights um, to the use of water in the South Tacoma, in what used to be called Nally Valley, 
in the South Tacoma Aquifer, considerable amount. And that's a, that's a second supply for the city of Tacoma. On top of all that, and I didn't learn this until I read one of the questions, we have a whole array, two pages if you go to our um, water supply plan, we have a whole array of rights in Northeast Tacoma, to springs, to groundwater, in Pierce County, and I didn't know this, we had transferred to us by the Port of Tacoma years ago, uh, two water rights on the very property that the methanol plant is proposed for, the Kaiser site, which are rights that Kaiser had, I believe. Uh, unless the port had them originally, I think Kaiser had them. So we do have two groundwater rights on that property. No intention to use them, but they do exist. So we have a pretty wide array of water rights. Mostly in, in, in normal years, water is provided from the Green River source. In low years like we had last summer, we do a lot of pumping of water from the South Tacoma Aquifer, which is not in continuity with the Green River. It's in the Puyallup River Basin. I'm taking too much time. So if you go to the... Um, the actual numbers, mostly for water and power. The proposed methanol plant, the last numbers we had, and again, these may not be the real numbers for the plant, that would be discussed if the EIS process starts up again, was 400 megawatts average daily used power. Uh, it would start up with a higher amount. And for water, 10.4 million gallons per day. I think people were working off a much higher water number, but at least this is the one we were given. Uh, if you look at the current system total average daily demand, power is at 551 average megawatts. That can go way up in certain periods, but that's the average. And water is at 56 million gallons per day. I'm told this is less than the, than the system historically had. But that's, that's the current top number. If you look at the Tide Flats area, we've, it's hard to break this down, but we tried our best, the, the industrial area. We've given two-year two data. Power uh, in 1958 um, had an average mega, uh, megawatts of 158.4. Well, 1985, sorry. 158.4 and now at 53.7. Water has a similar decline, but not as dramatic. 35.4 million gallons per day in 1985 and 16.9 million gallons per day in 2015. A lot of the decline in water, I'm told, is due to, well, first of all, a lot of, a lot of uh, facilities have closed on the port area, but also the um, plant that was Simpson, is now West Rock, has, whether, I'm not gonna argue about the use of water now, but the, the amount of water they've used has declined over the last 30 years for various conservation reasons. Uh, I, there was inquiries about this, so we tried to put numbers on our largest customers so you get an idea about comparisons. The largest power customer is West Rock, and the uh, military base is close behind. And I think both of those are on contracts which provide a particular rate for them. Uh, and then Praxair, after that, um, uh, there's no one quite in that category. For water, West Rock is by far the biggest user of water, if this plant, if the proposed plant used 10.10 10 million plus, it would be the second biggest. And we showed you the others are by far smaller. And to my surprise, actually, I've got the list of Niagara bottling is, I think, in the below 20th, between 20 and 30. They simply are not using the amount of water they had, they had proposed. We also put the, uh, uh, an important part of the water system is we are a wholesale provider to other municipalities. So we've listed our largest municipal suppliers just so you get an idea. Uh, so in conclusion, again, we're not taking sides. Um, if, if the plant were approved, there'd be, have to be a lot of discussion about the rates and those would have to be set by our board and council at public hearings. Um, for power, let me see, how can I say this? Um, the additional resources would have to be found, purchased, and supplied to the plant. We don't have a bank of that much power that we can go to and, and withdraw the, the power. Uh, although um, the, the RRP discusses where we would get it. Water's a different story, except for low, low years, like last year, the water system is sized large enough to the tide flats and the water rights are sufficient in normal years 
to, to provide that volume of water. They have historically provided larger volumes of water to, to the industrial area. So I'll be happy to ask questions a little later. So again, please, uh, I'm sure you have questions for Bob. Write them on cards, pass them to the center of the room, and we'll get to them at the end. I'm going to turn it over now to Dan Kirshner, who's the executive director of the Northwest Gas Association. Dan's driven up from Portland to be with us. So, thanks. Thank you, Joel. Thanks for the uh, opportunity to be here. Yeah. Um, just a couple of resources. Uh, one of them I'm going to reference in in my presentation, but this we've got uh, this little ditty for you out there. Just list some facts about how we use natural gas in Washington state, how we might, uh, might use it, and, and other opportunities for using natural gas. So please help yourself to that. Uh, and one of, the, uh, uh, one of the things that's on our, our, uh, this little takeaway is our website, which is www.nwga.org. And there's a lot, of, a lot of information on there about natural gas, including um, a uh, a report that we put together, call it a report. Uh, Bob mentioned integrated resource plans. All natural gas utilities have to do integrated resource plans every two years that identify, among other things, what they perceive the demand is going to be for natural gas and how they're going to serve that. We aggregate that into a report we call the, the uh, Northwest Gas Market Outlook, and uh, we publish that every year. So uh, we're getting ready to freshen up the 2015 with the 2016 version here in a month or so. But uh, there's a lot of the information I'm going to show you in here is actually contained in that report, including data tables and the like, if you're interested in, in digging a little deeper. So who is the Na uh, Northwest Gas Association? This is us. We represent uh, the Trade Association. Northwest Gas Association represents the natural gas utilities, uh, the LDCs that bring gas to your home. Uh, LDC is an uh, acronym for Local Distribution Company, which is how we typically refer to gas utilities, and the pipelines that ship gas from the production areas in Northeast British Columbia, Alberta, and the Rockies. That's where we source our gas, and I'll have another uh, slide on that in just a minute. So those are our members, and um, um, I, I will note, I'm not advocating, again, I'm not advocating uh, for this project or against this project. Joel invited me here to talk about the dynamics of natural gas, natural gas use in the Northwest, uh, why a project like this might even consider a locating in North America or in the Northwest, and how we get move gas around and where the gas is coming from. So, but that said, one of my members is an interested party in this, uh, in this project, uh, Williams Northwest Pipeline which is this pipeline here, uh, it would probably be uh, the service provider for, for these projects, okay? So why North America? Why does China or the Chinese want to maybe look at uh, developing methanol from natural gas in North America? Well, first they're looking at natural gas because the way they develop methanol today uh, is through coal and oil. So those are the basic feedstocks to methanol. It's a basically a hydrocarbon is what you need to create methanol. What do you want methanol for? In this case, it's for olefins, which are the basic product uh, that is required to make plastics. So every one of us in this room has a, an output of olefins, which is what methanol is made for. So this slide demonstrates where North America gets its natural gas. And you can see it's a vast resource. It's across the entire continent of North America, except maybe here, pretty interesting. Uh, but we got, a, we got a slug of gas up here and a whole bunch of gas over here. There's basically a lot of gas in North America. And, and I want to talk just a little bit about that. How much gas is there in North America? So. This is not the forum to talk about uh, production of natural gas, although I'm happy to answer questions about it if they come up. But how many of you have heard the term fracking? Okay. Fracking was a term coined by petroleum engineers about 60 years ago when this first uh, started being used. So hydraulic fracturing shortened by petroleum engineers to be called fracking. It's not a term that was developed by public relations professionals. <laughs> they suggest that we use the term well stimulation, which I'm not sure is any better. <laughs> but the result, and, and the other thing I'll point out is 
This dramatic increase you see in the availability of supply, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, is a result really not just of fracking, which is what you hear the most about, but it's the result of fracking combined with uh, horizontal directional drilling. Uh, so what we've done, what the industry has done, is found ways to produce natural gas from a resource that they could never produce it from before, shale, which is rock. So in fact, think of shale as being petrified mud. So these tide flats out here that we're talking about 65 million years ago, the shale were those tide flats. Today, with all that rock on top of them, they've become now shale, which, which holds a lot of oil and natural gas resource in it. So between being able to drill horizontally through that resource and fracture that resource to allow the hydrocarbons to move where they couldn't move before, uh, we have unleashed or unlocked a resource that we didn't have before. So you can see here historically the total available resource. This is done, by the way, by a group called the Potential Gas Committee, uh, located at Colorado State University but not affiliated with the university. It's an independent group that does this kind of assessment every two years. And you can see since 1950, I think. And you can see every couple of years, it's been bumping along right here and then something happened really in the mid uh, first decade of, of this millennia. And, and what happened was uh, we figured out how to drill and fracture this resource and begin producing. So what we've seen in the last 10 years is an increase in the available resource of about 125%. We didn't find, suddenly find this we, already, we always knew where it was. This is a technology play here, so we've just discovered how to extract the resource, okay? So big resource. <clears throat> and the North American market, where those production areas are that I showed you in a slide a couple of, a couple of slides ago, is well connected. This kind of shows flows across North America, and you can see that technically, a molecule produced in Pennsylvania could find its way up into the Northwest. Uh, it won't because somebody's gonna draw it off before it gets there, but technically it could. That is how interconnected this marketplace is across North America. <clears throat> so back to this slide, this is where we get our gas from uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. Again, Northeast British Columbia, Alberta, and the Rockies. Now you see this is a big slug up here. That's really considered one basin. But the real, the real action's happening right up here in Northeast British Columbia today. And then the Rockies. And you can see we're pretty well connected uh, to, to those resources, right? So let's talk about what that BC resource is. We saw a couple slides ago that we were talking about 2,500 trillion cubic feet of natural gas that we can extract from using shale now that's available to us. That's a lot of gas. Let's put that in context. North America consumes about 25 trillion cubic feet a year of natural gas for all uses. And by the way, natural gas is used for more than just heating your home and water. Uh, it's used for manufacturing plastics. It's used as a feedstock for uh, for fertilizer, it's used as process heat for the two by fours, things that go into your home. Uh, it's used for a whole raft of stuff. Um, so 2,500 trillion cubic feet, and then we can come back to the resource that we depend on here and see gas in place. That's how much gas and do they actually estimate is in that rock, 2,800 trillion cubic feet. How much do we think in today's world, with today's technologies, they can actually extract, let's call it 400 trillion cubic feet. And this area, this is again just northeast BC, is currently producing about 1.5 trillion cubic feet a year. Now let's put that in context, that number in context, how much gas do we consume in the Pacific Northwest? I'll show you here a slide in just a moment. <clears throat> so 1.5 trillion cubic feet, you can see 400 years of production at today's production rates. <clears throat> one of the things, I, I just want to make sure I had that second slide, but one of the things that's happening here is, again, a technological advancement. So first, we've been able to unlock that resource from the shale. And secondly, we found ways to get much more efficient at it. So this is the number of drilling rigs employed to produce oil and natural gas. This is actual natural gas production. 
So you can see dramatic declines in actual surface disturbance using, using new drilling technologies while, and by the way, disinvestment because gas and oil prices are very low right now, so uh, folks are not investing in drilling in new resources. So disinvestment in the resource, you can see here, um, and yet the resource continues to expand. That's, a, again, another technological player. They're getting better at this process, tighter at it. So 1.5 trillion cubic feet of production from Northeast BC, where we source most of our gas, certainly here in Tacoma, along the I-5 corridor, probably 70% of the gas we actually consume comes from Northeast BC. Another 10% or so from the Rockies and another 20% or so from Alberta. That changes as the price in those different basins changes. So uh, the, your providers here have the opportunity to select within their shipping capacities on the pipeline to select where they want to source their gas. But by and large, the biggest resource is, is uh, British Columbia. So this is historical demand. And you can see here we were almost at 900 billion cubic feet a year. That million decatherms is an energy resource. Call that 900 billion cubic feet. So a little more than half of that 1.5 trillion cubic feet, maybe 70% of it or 65% of it, comes right straight south and is consumed in Vancouver, Seattle, Tacoma, Portland, Spokane, Boise, uh, and the like. So how do we use natural gas in the Northwest? That's what this slide really shows. Again, historic demand. This is residential use down here, and you see, you know, if I put a trend line on that, it would be barely tilting up. This is commercial demand, so think institutions like the University of Washington, Tacoma. Uh, that's a commercial use. Uh, restaurants are a commercial use, and laundromats and the like. This is industrial uses, so think West Rock, that's an industrial user, or Kaiser Aluminum before they uh, left the area, uh, another industrial user. And this is electric generation. So two things to point out on this slide. Uh, we started out, actually this entire system was built on the back really of industrial uses in the region. And you can see here in 2000, 2001, we lost a big chunk and that was the exit of the primary metals industry from our region. Uh, so when Kaiser left, they are representative of the uh, 10 aluminum smelters that were operating in the region. Today there are two, those two are either idled or about to be idled. It's been announced that they will be idled. Uh, so, and then here, uh, in, with the Great Recession, we lost another tranche, and that was wooden paper products, really. So a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, paper and wood manufacturers or uh, growers, lumber, lumber guys and the like, they had more modern capacity and available capacity that they built in the southeast, so they shuttered some of the stuff we had uh, up here in, in the Northwest. And if you have ever driven south of Portland on I-5 through the little town called Albany, there was a big warehouser plant right on the freeway, which is now an empty lot. That's emblematic of, of again, what happened here. So the point of that is uh, we used to have a lot of industrial demand. We have less today than we have historically. The pipeline system was built to serve this industrial demand and these other demands uh, today. It does, it's not serving that as much. But what's displaced that then is this, this bar here, which is uh, gas for generation. So we use more gas. The trend line is up on this. <clears throat> but two things I'll point out about it. One, the trend line is up. We are using more and more gas to generate electricity in the region. And two, it's quite variable. So the resources we depend on in this region to generate electricity, by and large, there's four of them. There's hydro which is a super resource. We love it. It's a great legacy for our region. It's inexpensive because there's no fuel cost, sort of. Um, there is a fuel cost and we are paying it, uh, but, but effectively there's no uh, incremental cost to the, to the water moving through the system. It's also very flexible, so it can ramp up and down to match whatever's happening with renewable resources that we've been bringing on, like wind and increasingly solar. So hydro's number one. Uh, we love that resource. Uh, what's number two? Well, nuclear. We've got a big nuclear plant here. Generates a lot of electricity for the region. And you don't just turn on or turn off a nuclear plant. So it's there. It's running. S the third one is coal. We actually have a pretty significant uh, 
I mean, compared to the rest of the country, it's not significant at all. I mean, nationwide in the U.S., 6% of power is generated with hydroelectricity. In Washington state, it's 65%. So that's how blessed we are here. But some of our power comes from coal. And the last resource on and the first resource off is natural gas. So because it's flexible, but it also has a, a price to the fuel. So first one, first one off, last one on. So those four resources are what we depend on in the region. <clears throat> this is our forecast going forward. I always go back and forth, should I show you stack bar? Should I show you lines? The bottom line here is there's a little bit of growth. Most of the growth is being driven uh, by forecasted demand for additional electric generation. That's as we utilize plants in the region that we already have in a more flexible fashion to back up the wind and solar, especially the wind resource that we have in the region and increasingly solar. Uh, they need something to back up when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining and gas is that resource that we're depending on in this region. Um, I should say we've depended on hydro up to this point in time, but the hydro system's ability is about tapped out and so now we're increasingly relying on natural gas as that resource. That's what's driving most of the growth. There's a little bit of growth in residential and commercial, almost no growth in the industrial side. This is a design day, and I'm not sure it's a useful slide. Uh, this, this is the aggregation. So this is one day's demand across each of the years. And this is the way that uh, LDCs plan their systems is they have an obligation to serve, which Bob spelled out in one of those statutes. They have to serve you with the gas if you're connected to the system. And so they have to build their system to serve you on the coldest day that can reasonably be expected to happen in our region, right? Different utilities have different planning standards for that. Uh, one in Eastern Washington um, is uh, coldest day in history, which was December 28, 1968. I was 10 years old and I remember that day. It got, was 50 below. Uh, it averaged actually across the 24 hour period about about uh, 20 below, it was a very cold day. Uh, but they, they, it's not just that day that they plan their standard to, there's other things that they lay into that. But the point is they, they take a look at what's the coldest day that we could reasonably be expected to have to serve and we need to build our system to serve that. And then we plot against that, uh, so this is across the whole region, so these demand bars assume it's that coldest day in Vancouver, British Columbia, in uh, Boise, Idaho, in Portland, and in Spokane, and all points in between on that same day. So there's a little bit of slush in these bars. Uh, and then we plot against that the capacity we have via pipelines, via underground storage, and via above ground liquefied natural gas storage, which we have some facilities in the region to serve just this purpose. Okay, and what this picture tells you is, on that coldest day, our system is right-sized. So, uh, but what, what it doesn't show you is that on an average day, there's a lot of capacity in the system, right? So this is that coldest day. I put this slide up because I animated it. It was the first slide I ever animated and I wanna show it. <laughs> um, it this depicts uh, projects proposed to serve the region. These are infrastructure expansion projects proposed to serve the region prior to the recession. Prior to the recession, we were looking at, we were really starting to bump up against the limits of the system, available system. Uh, and we were starting to bump up against that. So uh, these were projects proposed to serve the region. No investment came across to any of these projects. Uh, only one got built. This was this one here, which I'll show you. So what happened after the recession? Well, several of the projects fell off the map, quite literally. And some of them were redrawn to reflect new, uh, new demands or new potential demands. This one got built. This one was really designed to serve Northern California. We get very little gas off of this system up this line. So the point is the, the infrastructure market responds to what's going on in the region. At the same time, uh, there's none of these projects really have been built other than this one, which really isn't relevant to our region. So we have a bunch of projects proposed for the region. And, and uh, uh, infrastructure proposed to serve them. But I think the point I wanna make in this slide is that if infrastructure is built, it's probably not gonna be 
any one of these. It's probably going to be a combination of these kind of projects. Um, so, and, and most of the infrastructure that's being proposed is really, is really brownfield infrastructure. So it's laying pipe alongside existing pipe. Okay. And this is what demand might look like, uh, some, some segments of demand. So we know in Washington State, this is my last slide, uh, we know in Washington State that we're going to need to replace some coal-fired generation that we, we already have here, Centralia. There's a big coal plant down there that's going to retire in 2020. And uh, at Boardman, Oregon, there's another smaller plant that's going to also retire in 2020. And so we put together some scenarios that we thought, well, what do we think is reasonable to expect in terms of gas replacing? And that's that green segment there. We also have some some projects proposed to serve the region, industrial, general industrial projects, LNG for transportation for marine, for ferries, uh, for tote shipping and the like, marine applications uh, and others. And then we've got one big project uh, represented here. So this could be an LNG export terminal like the Oregon LNG terminal, or it could be, for instance, all of the methanol plants that Northwest Innovation Works is proposing. So you can see there are significant demands, uh, but again, infrastructure development isn't going to be driven by any one of these. It's going to be driven by a combination of organic demand and these kinds of things. So with that, I'll wait for questions uh, later, and I thank you for the opportunity. Great, thanks, Dan. Thank you, sir. Please. So we're going to move right on. We're um, Eric DePlace. Eric is the policy director for the Sightline Institute, which why don't you say a few words about Sightline as well? It might be new to some of some of the crowd here. I'll turn it to you and I'll get your slides going here. Okay, thank you, Joel. And um, <clears throat> thanks everyone for being here. I wanted to um, say a special thank you to um, uh, Center for Urban Waters and uh, uh, Citizens for a Healthy Bay for hosting this discussion forum. Uh, I think it's a good one. I wasn't uh, here in person uh, for the one that was, I think, two weeks ago, but I did watch it uh, online. Uh, and um, you know, it's, it, it was interesting because I think I learned more from that uh, series of presentations and from the presentations tonight than I have um, uh, in the last two or three months of studying these projects. Um, so I guess that's a way of saying thank you to the people who've put this on, um, but also maybe a, a small indictment from the project backers who haven't uh, answered a huge number of the questions that I think we'd all like to have answered. Um, so I'm going to try to dig into some more of those and see if we can flesh out some more information about these projects uh, and this particular project at Tacoma uh, over the course of the next few minutes. Um, but before that, uh, a word about Sightline Institute. We are a public policy research uh, center, a think tank. Uh, we're headquartered in Seattle, but we work uh, across the Pacific Northwest, mostly in Oregon and Washington, sometimes in British Columbia. Uh, we work on a whole range of issues connected to sustainability in the region. Uh, my particular slice of that pie is kind of energy and climate policy. And in particular, I've worked on energy transport projects over the last few years. So that's kind of the background that I'll bring to... Um, to bear on tonight's talk. Uh, and I think maybe the um, sort of orienting principle for um, what I'm hoping to contribute this evening uh, is, is this picture. I like this picture of this little girl looking at sort of a telescope um, from the wrong end. Uh, and I have this sense sometimes that when we look at projects, um, we tend to look at a very specific project in a very specific footprint. And that's appropriate, of course, because it's in a specific location and a specific community. And it's good to evaluate those things. But also, it sometimes gives us uh, uh, in my judgment, sort of a, uh, an unrealistic, narrow view. And so what I'd like to do is sort of step back from a second. I think it actually pairs well with the presentation that Dan just gave and look at some of the regional picture uh, of how we think about energy and energy flows because I think that larger regional context can help inform uh, what's being proposed here specifically in Tacoma and how it connects with some other uh, things. All right, so... Um, this is a wildly um, too simplistic depiction of what's gone on over the last few years, and this doesn't uh, capture any of the important nuance here. But uh, real quickly, let me just uh, explain what this map is all about. So uh, on the right-hand side, you see three red blobs. Uh, those are the big tar sand fields in uh, Alberta, the Athabascan uh, tar sands or oil sands. Uh, then the big, um, the Williston Basin that contains the Bakken Shale Play, which is a home of a lot of uh, light oil that's been extracted recently. Uh, and then in the south, the Powder River Basin coal fields. Uh, and over the last, call it five, six years, we have seen a huge number of proposals in the Pacific Northwest to extract that, those resources uh, and move them across, uh, not actually flying in arrows, but uh, on, on rails and pipelines and ships, 
across the world's hungriest energy markets, and those are indicated in purple uh, on the left-hand side of the map. So that kind of, this really simplistic sort of Rorschach level um, depiction uh, is kind of, in my judgment, the driver behind some of these really kind of nasty, robust, controversial debates that we've had in this region uh, over the last few years. Um, if you lived north of the border, uh, if you lived in British Columbia, um, these projects would have, you would be so annoyed at listening to debates about these projects that you wouldn't want to hear anything more about them. These are two big uh, pipelines that were scheduled, uh, proposed, and were very serious proposals um, from the Alberta tar sands to the coast uh, for export, mostly to the Pacific markets. Uh, both of those are in, are in pretty big trouble now, which is surprising, um, particularly the northern one. But those are very large oil pipeline projects. Um, uh, then we have, this is a radically too conservative depiction. Um, uh, Dan mentioned a second ago, uh, two LNG projects, these are the pipelines that would serve those LNG projects uh, in Oregon, uh, the Jordan Cove project that I've labeled the Pacific Connector there, and then the Oregon LNG project. Uh, and then as well in Canada, uh, at least four new pipelines proposed. I think actually in terms of LNG facilities, it might be like 21 separate projects maybe or something. It's a, it's a really huge number. Uh, it's hard to wrap your head around that. Uh, and again, it's because of the success that the industry has had in uh, hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling to unleash this um, fairly enormous resource. Uh, similarly, um, that same success that the gas industry has had has knocked the legs out of the domestic coal industry, which was uh, one of the reasons why we saw this huge rush to the exits uh, of coal export proposals over the last few years. And so um, there's a complicated story about why that all happened, but I think most folks are familiar with the kind of red-hot rhetoric around coal exports. Um, same thing for uh, oil by rail. Uh, most of the uh, oil train projects, we saw 14 or 15 of them crop up in Oregon and Washington over the last few years. Those are driven by extracting uh, a light shale oil out of uh, shale play, very similar to what Dan was explaining uh, for the gas resource, and that's coming out principally of western North Dakota and some surrounding regions. So all that stuff basically rushing to a few exit points along North America's coast, mid-Atlantic, Gulf Coast, and the Pacific Northwest, um, playing a very particular role that we're talking about here. So I mention all this not to get bogged down in these particular projects, but to put the methanol plant here in Tacoma in context for what's happened. And this is all new. All these projects I've showed are new uh, since 2012, really. These are all proposals. Very few of them have actually been built. Um, not as a way of making a point about the environment, but simply as a way of illustrating the scale of these projects. Um, this is the carbon content that is... Um, how much carbon would be emitted by the CO2, uh, or by the, by the fuel, rather, uh, inside those, that would be contained in those projects if it were all combusted. Uh, on the left is Keystone XL Pipeline, uh, which has you know, been held up as a litmus test of President Obama's environmental credibility. And on the right are these projects stacked one on top of the other. Uh, so natural gas pipelines on the bottom, oil by rail, oil, coal. Um, so it's a lot that we've seen in the Northwest. It's like five and a half, six times as much as the Keystone XL pipeline just in new projects, just proposed since, let's call it 2011, 2012, something like that. And it's in this context that I think it is, that we can sort of turn our attention then to the particular proposals that uh, Northwest Innovation Works has brought to the Northwest, two of which are on the Columbia River and then the biggest of which uh, is here in Tacoma. Uh, but before we get all the way down to um, the Tacoma Tide Flats, I want to go to this slide because this slide um, comes from a report that I just published, I guess, last week. I think it was last week. And what this does is look at um, this sort of third wave. I think of sort of three waves of projects. First, we had coal exports come our way. Then we had oil by rail come our way. And the third wave is kind of this mouthful of fracked fuel and petrochemical projects. It's light hydrocarbons, basically. Um, that have we are extracting in abundance. They're relatively inexpensive, and as a consequence, we've seen this rush of proposals of this category. So, uh, three uh, liquefied natural gas projects, including one in Tacoma, two big ones in Oregon that are for export, uh, three methanol projects, uh, a very curious hybridized beast at Longview that was a combination of shale oil and propane. Um, that one actually just died last week. Uh, and then at Anacortes at the Tesoro Refinery, um, a project to create xylene, which is a niche refining project that is also used in the manufacture of plastics and is also destined for China. Uh, all, anyway, all this stuff, I think this is the larger context. All of these proposals are new within the last couple of years, and all of them are designed, in my judgment, um, not so much as sort of an arm of the Chinese government reaching over and saying, we're going to do this so much as uh, the West having abundant, cheap uh, supplies of light hydrocarbons and trying to figure out someplace 
to market and sell those. And so the question becomes whether or not um, that's a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, and uh, before we reach any of those conclusions, sort of what are the facts about them? So, okay, that was a really long introduction, um, but I promise I'm gonna wrap up on time still. Uh, when we consider some of the environmental um, claims that this project has made, these project backers have made, there are two that I really want to um, to hit on for a while. So I, I am a dropout from a PhD program in philosophy, and so uh, you're going to see a little bit of that right now. Hopefully not the dropout part, but uh, but the philosophy part. There are two assumptions that are sort of layered into the claims um, that the project backers have made, and I do want to spend some really serious time trying to evaluate the veracity of these claims. Uh, the first one is that the the project is actually lower carbon than alternatives. That is taking natural gas, converting it to methanol, shipping it to China, turning that methanol into olefins, and turning that into plastics is cheaper, or is a lower carbon uh, prospect than the alternatives. Now, it's no question that converting uh, natural gas to methanol is a lower carbon prospect than converting coal, or naphtha, uh, to methanol. But the question is whether or not this, the whole supply chain is a lower carbon alternative than creating plastics in some other fashion. Uh, and so that's number one, and that's a, that's a big serious question. And they've put a lot of weight on that question. The second question is, even if we say that that's true, let's say we, let's say we let's go ahead and we, can, we figure out that the evidence says, okay, well that, that's true, it is lower carbon. But then we have to wonder, well does it actually displace higher carbon versions of that activity? That is, does it crowd out of the marketplace existing dirty ways of producing plastics? Or does it prevent uh, new dirty ways of coming online or something like that? Uh, or is it just additive? Does it just add to the total production of carbon, the, add, or the total production of plastics? And what I would submit, and I, I don't, I know this is, I fully understand that this is not a forum for advocacy at all, but, um, but simply as an informational se session, there is no evidence to support either one of those claims that I can find. I have spent a considerable chunk of time um, badgering the company, trying to get um, evidence to support these claims, uh, badgering the governor's office, badgering the Department of Commerce, and I've been, <coughs> I've drawn nothing. Uh, and so uh, that doesn't mean that it's wrong. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that we haven't seen any evidence to support that claim. And I would hope that if and when they come back with a revised project proposal, that they would provide something that looks like reasonably serious evidence so that we can evaluate um, whether or not these things are, uh, are, are true. To go back to the regional context, we've seen all these projects, dozens of these projects. I've been involved uh, in, a, in a fairly serious way with many of them, and almost every single one of them uh, will build themselves as a clean energy solution. So this down here on the right-hand corner, this is the largest oil by rail unloading facility anywhere in North America, possibly anywhere in the world. That's proposed for Vancouver, Washington. Uh, and it's being, they're billing themselves as a purveyor of low carbon shale oil. Uh, the Anacortis upgrade, that's the xylene production unit I mentioned at that refinery, is uh, a clean products upgrade. It's a cleaner way of making plastics, according to them. Jordan Cove LNG, one of the biggest LNG sites anywhere in the country, uh, again, billing themselves. So not that these aren't true. Again, these could be true. And there are actually some important reasons to think that there are at least um, dimensions of those projects that are better than alternatives but simply that uh, for all of these Russia projects, the project backers have typically claimed that they're clean energy solutions. And so um, many times those have proven not to be justified. Uh, even the coal backers, even the coal export terminals originally came in claiming that. So my sort of reflexive attitude has been one of skepticism, not to say that it's outright false, um, but that I'm skeptical. And so when I have tried to examine the scientific literature on these questions, because the project backers didn't provide it, nor did the governor's office, um, there's not much out there that I can find, at least not much that I can interpret um, for myself. There is this one article, though. Uh, this is published in 2006, so you could argue that maybe it's not current with the technology as Northwest Innovation Works has proposed now, but it's the best that I could find. Um, I would like to, again, this is the last time I'm going to say this, I promise, but I hope that the project backers come back with something that we can evaluate because uh, otherwise they'll just leave it to me by my lonesome. Um, and, but what the, I'll just read from the abstract because I think it's really, worth, it's really worth grasping this. They make two really good points in the abstract that they justify in the article. And they say methane-based routes use more than twice as much process energy than state-of-the-art steam cracking routes. Um, and that's, and the, the basic idea here is that it, this is not the most energy efficient way uh, to get to uh, an olefin. Uh, and the second point they made is that the methane-based routes can be economically attractive in regions where natural gas is available at low prices, which is where we are. Um, so that is all a long way of saying, 
you might do this um, because gas is cheap, but you probably wouldn't do it because it's a clean energy or it's a particularly energy efficient solution. Um, Dan mentioned this before, but this is, this is from the BP statistical, um, they do an annual update of, of world energy forecast and prices. Uh, the yellow line is how much natural gas costs in East Asia, right there. Uh, and the red line is how much it costs, basically. That's the reference price uh, for us. So it's about you know, four or five times more expensive in East Asia uh, than it is here. And I, I would submit that this kind of basic economic fact is one of the key drivers behind these projects, because we do have abundant supplies of low-cost natural gas. That's really real. Um, and that is probably as big a driver as anything else um, for this interest. Now, the way that, I, so I, I wanna go back to the abstract for a second. Um, that first line used more than twice as much process energy, so you could, you could sort of conclude from that. So process energy includes both the energy uh, of the fuel, in this case the methane or the natural gas that's combusted on site, plus the power. Um, now, if that power is carbon free, then maybe it's still an energy win, um, or a carbon win. Um, but what I would um, point out, and I think this is consistent with the presentations we've heard so far, um, we can think, so Tacoma has a public utility, we've heard about that, that's important. Tacoma, unlike many other utilities, actually produces its own power and supplies its own customers. It's completely vertically integrated. Uh, it also, you know, it purchases power off the marketplace. But Tacoma, like every other place, is embedded in a western grid of power, and so when you go out shopping for power, um, it turns out there's certain sort of extra carbon-free hydropower out there available for purchase. Um, it's all being used by somebody else. Those dams that are running are sending that power somewhere to industrial users or residential users or whomever and using that power. So when, generally speaking, this is a wild oversimpl oversimplification, but generally speaking, if you have a big new power load that comes on, 400 or 450 megawatts, uh, and you go out shopping for a new supply for that power, you can't sort of go out and, and say, okay, well, I'm gonna take the clean stuff and leave the dirty stuff for somebody else. I mean, you might get a contract for hydropower, but, it would, but with the effect of that across the Western grid is that you're nudging somebody else out and somebody else picks up gas-fired power, coal-fired power, wind power, whatever. But there's, a, but there's a carbon profile to that new marginal increment of power. Um, and typically speaking, the way to think about it is, uh, the simplest way to think about it is it's natural gas because natural gas is flexible, it's adaptable, we're building new gas plants all over the place. And so really, when we think about what the power is that would supply the methanol facility here in Tacoma, the right way to think about that is probably a gas-fired turbine somewhere in the western grid that is churning up uh, new electricity to power that plant. So it's not carbon-free. Now it's not coal either, so, um, which is good. Um, probably running a little long on time, so I'm gonna step through this relatively quickly. Um, it's my contention um, that natural gas is not good enough for where we want to be. Um, we need it now. We need oil as well. We can't, um, if we took away gas and oil tomorrow, we would be in the zombie apocalypse. But uh, I don't want to be in the zombie apocalypse, but I also don't want to be in a climate disaster apocalypse. And so it is my contention that we need a relatively rapid uh, transition away from those fuels. Bill Gates uh, gave this fantastic interview in The Atlantic recently, uh, and he made the point that we need to vault over building large-scale sort of new gas infrastructure and instead transition directly to renewable uh, energy. And I, and I share that view. That's not to say, that again, that we don't need it now, but we need to be moving away from it and probably not building large-scale new infrastructure to support the old way of doing business. Um, I would also say this, and maybe Dan and I will argue about this later on in Q&A, but um, so natural gas emissions can be complicated and they're often a little bit worse than they look. Uh, on a sort of um, superficial comparison, the, the direct combustion of coal compared to the direct combustion of natural gas, natural gas is substantially cleaner, um, both from an air, like a local air emissions perspective, but also from a carbon emissions perspective. Um, that, those things come into closer balance um, when you look at both the risk of there being leaks uh, or escapes of methane uh, along the whole supply chain from the extraction point uh, to the transportation point um, to the handling. Um, and then I would also argue, um, and there's a whole debate about whether natural gas is actually worse than coal and blah, 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 and uh, we can get into the technological or the sort of the technical merits of that claim. Uh, a lot of it depends on kind of how you think about it. Um, and I don't think it's actually true in any case, but it's, but it's not as good as it looks. Uh, initially. The, the last point, and I have only really two more points before I wrap up, um, is that uh, we have tended to think about this because the project packers have described it this way, as this methanol is going to go 
um, into plastics. Uh, and as Joel did a really good job of pointing this out in the, in the first talk, that methanol is super useful. It can be used for a hundred different things. Uh, and one of the things that it can be used for increasingly effectively uh, is, for, is, a, is a direct combustion source for transportation fuel. Uh, and we're seeing uh, the Chinese government and a few other places really scale this up in a large way. So right now, I think this is a, a statistic from 2014 or 2013, uh, China's already using 12 million tons a year to fuel vehicles. The plant for Tacoma is about 7 million tons. Um, so it's not like the Tacoma plant would go directly into vehicles tomorrow, but also the plant's not going to be built tomorrow. It is entirely possible that we could take methanol produced from cheap gas in the West, the Western US, send it to China or wherever, uh, and simply use that as an alternative um, to gasoline. Now, there's an interesting argument that that's actually an environmental benefit, right? Um, and that's worth unpacking. It's not super clear one way or the other whether that's good or bad. Um, but somebody has to actually unpack that. Somebody has to actually do the math um, to, to figure that stuff out. And we haven't, we haven't seen that so far. Um, among other things, it also means that the carbon in that natural gas doesn't end up sequestered in the casing for your iPhone. Um, it ends up being, uh, in some fashion or another, combusted and sent up into the atmosphere. And so, again, looking at the full picture of the carbon profile, we'd want to do those calculations and figure it out. Um, last point. Um, this is the point that I try to make in every single talk that I do about coal, oil, natural gas, whatever. Um, there's no fixed demand for anything. Um, we often see um, the project backers will come in and say, look, here's what's going to happen. If we look out 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, uh, our product, our coal, our oil, we're going we're to be consuming so much of it you can't even believe it. And so the question is not um, whether you build, whether we're going to consume this stuff, it's whether you're going to do it here or somewhere else. And that has turned out not to be true. It's not true for oil. It's not true for coal. This stuff doesn't exist in a vacuum. Nothing exists. Bananas, bicycles, I don't care. It, nothing exists. Um, there's no natural demand for anything that's independent of supply and price. And so if we supply lots of something, if we supply lots of natural gas, the price drops and we consume more of it. If we supply less of it, the price generally rises and we consume less of it. That's all straight out of Econ 101, and I fully realize that economics does not stop at Econ 101, but it is important to bear in mind that there's, an, there's a truth there. And so um, to me, what that leaves us with is this notion that we kind of have a choice about what happens. Um, we can make decisions for Tacoma uh, that bear closely on what happens in Tacoma, and those have upstream and downstream ripple effects that may be good or bad, and I think it's important that we try to kind of do the math, try to ask some of these tougher questions, which I think is a super useful um, exercise for this debate about whether or not, you know, if we say no to a project like this, does that make things better or worse somewhere else? Uh, that whole exercise is um, not simplistic. Uh, we shouldn't be flip about it. Uh, but um, I said I wasn't going to say it again, but I'm going to say it. But we need a lot more information uh, from the project backers, and we need a lot more analysis about how this stuff should work and how we should think about it. Because, you know, in fairness, if Tacoma decides to cite a project like this here, it, this community is taking some obvious direct risks upon itself. It may be justified, but we have to see um, some form of analysis that would make that justification apparent, and we haven't seen that right now. So I'll wrap up with that, and I'm looking forward to Q&A. Thanks again. All right, that was fantastic, all three of you. Um, I hope you get the sense this is a fairly complicated issue, and I couldn't agree with you more. There's a lot more math that needs to be done on this, so we're gonna we're gonna get into that. We're gonna take it. We're running a little late. We're gonna take about a five minute break. Get up, stretch your legs, use the restroom if you need to. Come back really quickly. We'll reconvene at uh, let's call it 7:15. We'll go about a half hour on Q&A. If you have questions for any of the three speakers, please uh, write them out, bring them down, give them to Melissa or Ryan. Ryan here. Ryan, wave hand. Yeah. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and reconvene. Um, we're, we're probably going to run until about 8 o'clock. Uh, I know it's a little later than we had scheduled, but I think it's a good conversation, and we'll, we'll stay as long as we, uh, we can to get through as many of these questions as we can. So Melissa Malott from Citizens for Healthy Bay is going to take over, run the Q&A session. So she's, again, she's asking the questions that you've written to her, um, and then they'll respond, and then there'll be a chance to uh, 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 do a follow-up if, if necessary. Okay, and I'll have a microphone for that. So. All right, thank you. Thanks everyone for being here tonight. Um, 
Last time at the end of the session, I asked for feedback, and one of the points of feedback that I got was that there wasn't enough audience interaction. So what I'm going to do is um, ask a question, and at the end of it, uh, if that was your question, I'll just ask, did that answer the question for people? Does that sound good? Okay. So um, some of these cards, though, have kind of messy handwriting. So uh, I'm going to do my best. Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, the first question, and I don't know who exactly to direct this to. Um, actually, I'm going to start out with one that is directed at Mr. Mack. Uh, your talk was strictly about customer demand and silent about available supply. So what percentage of available supply is currently being used, and what percentage would be used by the proposed methanol plant? Um, so I don't know if that's with regard to power or water. Uh, the, the water answer is a little more complicated. For power, um, the projected use is considerably higher than what our present supply is. Um, we have, uh, I hope this answers the question, I have all these documents here because for water it gets a lot more complicated. Uh, we have met our uh, power growth through conservation. In other words, we have had a decline in demand because of conservation programs, and so we have not had to obtain new resources. There's been criticisms of us, for example, for not buying renewable energy, but to buy renewable energy, we have buy, bought RECs, but to buy renewable energy, we have to pay for at a certain price much higher than what we can sell our surplus power at. And so because we have a relatively high number of low-income customers. We have the highest percentage of the major power utilities in the Puget Sound area. Uh, and renters, we have about 40% of our residential users are renters. Um, we have traditionally tried to avoid purchasing new resources. And most of our power comes from Bonneville and from our own dams. So for power, there would have to be uh, an analysis of uh, what power is available if there is. Um, people have mentioned the two, uh, uh, this may be too long an answer to shorten it, the two uh, uh, aluminum plants that are idle or may go out of existence. The planners will tell you that's, that provides additional capacity because the power they were using is now available in the market. Assuming, there's, assuming they have a right to it or the, BP, or the Bonneville Power Administration is going to resell it. So there'd have to be all these analyses done about what power is available in the district. We have not been in the business of buying power. Water is a little more complicated, but without giving you the numbers uh, in total, we have adequate water rights to serve uh, our current capacity plus this plant plus a lot more. We, the, our system was sized in the inner war years uh, after World War I and World War II to provide much larger volumes of water in the industrial area than we provide now. Now, I'm not going to argue. Uh, we, be, we can argue from a public policy standpoint if that makes sense. But we do not use, uh, except in low flow periods, um, the, uh, all the water were allotted out of the Green River. By the way, there are limitations on what we can take out of the river. So there are in-stream flows that were established by the Department of Ecology agreed to by us in our permit, established through an agreement between us and the Corps of Engineers and between us and the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe. And so we do not withdraw uh, certain amounts of water during the summer, and then we go to other sources. But if you look at all of our sources, and I, I don't want this to sound like we, are, we believe in wasting water, we have adequate water rights that we, we haven't even not, have not even used in the area to serve in a normal period, in normal precipitation periods, this load and a much higher load. So we just have that large number of water rights. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a follow-up to that. And uh, for the sake of time and so that we can get through all the questions, I ask everyone to, yeah, just be really pointed. Um, so sure, we might have adequate water rights, but um, how does that reconcile with the fact that we're facing a water uncertain future? Water rights under the law is different than reality with climate change. Well, I don't know what people mean by a water uncertain future. If you're talking about climate change, the three large uh, utilities in the Puget Sound through the Puget Sound Water Supply Forum did a study five or six years ago, 
It anticipated at the most by the year 2075, Tacoma supply might be four to 8% lower. It simply would come into the area in a different way than it does now, more in precipitation, less in snowfall. Um, we, the three utilities, large utilities, Seattle, Ever, and Tacoma are doing more studies on that. But the, the essential system will not have significant declines even under climate change. It's just that the water will fall at different times and in different ways. And all I can tell you is we have water rights. The rights actually require us, the last water right, to perfect the right at a certain volume which we haven't even reached yet, uh, as long as we're consistent with the in-stream flow set for the Green River. Is I'm not gonna defend water uses in the Southwest or in Las Vegas or in Phoenix or irrigation rights in parts of eastern Washington, but I don't, our situation is just different than those. Is our, uh, right now our water usage is based off of snowpack that melts and goes into the reservoir, correct? Some of it, mostly is not snowpack in the Green River. What percentage of it is from snowpack in well, the Green that River? That I don't know. It varies by years. This year, the, in 2015, it was a much lower amount. But there has not been a significant, there was a decline in the amount of precipitation, obviously, in that watershed. But not, we, we went to, I'm not justifying wasting water, but we went to a voluntary cutback. And our customers, fortunately, uh, in the aggregate, reduced our, reduced our demand by about 15 to 16% in the summer of 2015. But this year, for example, the precipitation numbers are higher than normal. So the watershed will have... Um, uh, at least if we're drawing water now, have sufficient water. If the, if, the, if the flows are not high in the summer, of course, then there is a decline. But, but, the, but the South Tacoma Aquifer is recharged fairly quickly. It's in gravels, glacial gravels. And we have pumped that uh, in low flow periods. And the response uh, recovery time is fairly quick in that well field. I'm not telling you we would draw it down to any dangerous level, but... Our system is integrated in so we can use both ground and surface. If this was built um, in the future, if there is a drought or if there's a precipitation pattern that allows, doesn't allow us to retain water in the aquifer um, like we do now, and we're facing a water shortage, how do you reconcile that with um, the fact that they, this utility has to provide as much water as they demand? Well, you're allowed to cut back. So the city, so we have adopted a water response plan. Uh, it was adopted in a shortage plan in 2005. Uh, we actually went to a stage three in uh, uh, 1992, which was a worse year than 2015. The, the, everyone who lives through in a year thinks that's the worst year that ever happened. It wasn't. And uh, we actually went to mandatory cutbacks. The contracts with uh, Simpson, provide for an interruptible supply so they can be cut off uh, so we don't have to cut off water for other people. Whether we would do that for another large customer, that's really up to the city council. But, um, and I, I'm taking a lot of time, but there have been times of extended drought. People, I, I've worked in water for some time. People forget, they, they remember the Dust Bowl, they forget that in the Pacific Northwest in the late 1920s and early 1930s, there was an extended consecutive number of years of low flow. There are areas of eastern Washington where orchards have disappeared and never reappeared because the, the stream flows and the watersheds were adversely affected. We had the same result here. So there are periods of extended low flow, but our policy uh, allows for that and allows to interrupt if, if, if they're identified in the rate policy, large customers. So we do that for West Rock. Whether we would do that for this plant would be up to the board and the city council. Speaking of extended periods of low flow um, and potentially other disruptive things like that, um, would this, would the building of this plant and its water usage limit growth, residential growth in the area, in the service territory? In the volumes we were, so I have to uh, qualify this. In the volumes that they proposed under normal flow periods, in other words, not drought periods, or extended periods like 2015, it should not limit residential growth. The, the, the truth is that all through the Northwest and actually the United States, well, the Western United States, residential water use has declined per residence 
considerably so that actually Seattle, Tacoma, and Everett supply less water now to their service areas than, we, than all three of us did 50 years ago significantly. And it's not just the closure of industrial plants, it's because people do not use water like they used to. If you just drive through my neighborhood near UPS, there are a lot of brown lawns and they were brown in 2014 as well as 2015. So we do not think it would reduce uh, water use for uh, residential expansion. Now, if it did, that would be something that should be discussed during the environmental review process. All right, and then playing off of that and um, talking about water and energy, does the Port Tacoma Public Utilities or the city have a climate adaptation plan to respond to the impacts of climate change? So I'm talking about sea level rise, water quantity, um, especially with flood or drought, and uh, storm surges? Well, I can't speak for the port. Um, the, uh, Tacoma Public Utilities participated with the city of Tacoma, and I forget the name, the name of the study. Someone here may know about it. We did, what was it called? Climate Resilience, Climate Resilience Study. Mr. Parvey helped me out. Um, uh, the city just completed a plan on that. I don't know if it's, uh, I think it's been presented. We participated in that. It identified uh, uh, area, geographical areas of the city that there should be concerns about. Uh, none of them really directly affected Tacoma Public Utilities. Uh, we're rare in the, our major water source actually is not in the city and it's not even in the county, it's in King County. So, um, uh, and it's at higher level elevation. So it would not affect that uh, unless, I, unless, unless, unless over time there was a kind of a decline in total amounts. And our groundwater aquifer should not be affected. I mean, could be affected, but it's recharged basically by surface flow in the South Tacoma area. I, I, it sounds like I'm, in, I, I'm it, I don't wanna make it sound like I'm dismissive of these concerns, but I'm afraid that our system does not fit some of the arguments that people wanna make. And I'm not saying they should make arguments or they shouldn't be opposed, but um, I'm just trying to describe the facts of our system. They don't always fit the arguments people wanna make. Thank you. Um, the next question is, Tacoma's IRP says where it will get new large blocks of power. What is that power? I can read from it. It says that we did, it's actually it says that we do not anticipate any, any large demand. Uh, but if it were to occur, um, then there's a discussion of where we would obtain it. So it discusses renewable power, hydroelectric, uh, hydroelectric from irrigation, uh, incremental hydro. And now admittedly, when you're talking about the volumes you're talking about, this is, this is large, this is like 80% increase, I think, in our power supply. Uh, I could not tell you where we're gonna get that power. I don't know. And that would have to be discussed during the environmental review period. But um, because we have not had to face it before, the IRP does not discuss in any detail where you would get additional power for that big uh, load. For whoever asked that question, do you have a follow-up to that? Does that answer your question? I actually asked that question. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was my Wait question. Wait a minute. Because, and I, I wasn't, it, I'm not, not, not to play gotcha, but I, you answer it? I, I don't know where it comes from. I mean, I assume that it, I, uh, on some level it, it comes from additional gas, but... Um, but there, but there are, I mean, I was just talking to a gentleman here, I mean, there are these complicated assumptions. We assume that hydropower is basically tapped out, that we're not going to be burning too much more coal, probably less coal. We're not going to be building new nuke facilities, probably, because they're super expensive. Renewables are growing, but they're still relatively small, so then what's left? Gas um, and some transactional stuff on the Western market, but uh, I have to assume that a block that size is predominantly gas. But I'd be delighted to find out that that's, not accurate. I just have a question, uh, maybe for Bob, real quick, and that, that is, would Tacoma Power necessarily be the provider of power for the plant, or would it be the conduit, the provider of transmission, and the plant could potentially buy the power wherever the plant might be able to find the power? Uh, it's a good question, and one we've avoided answering um, to date. But um, uh, under the state law, we would be the... Uh, required to provide the power, but it is conceivable, I suppose, that, and this did happen during the uh, um, half deregulation we had a few uh, decades earlier in the century, 
for if people can remember it, we had some large industries in the Tide Flats area that thought they could get cheaper power off of our system, and we made and we basically transmitted the power to them. But then when the price of that went up, they had to come back on our system and pay a penalty. So I suppose during the environmental review, someone could look at whether if we, uh, Tacoma Power did not purchase the power if the applicant would, but then the applicant would have to use our uh, transmission and distribution facilities to get the power to the plant unless, unless it wanted to build its own transmission and distribution system, which I don't think it would. Our, I'm taking a lot of time, but our basic rate policy is that the charges are based on the cost of service. So when you have, I don't want to predict what would happen, but when you have that large a customer, and otherwise we would not have to purchase that additional power, the cost of service I would assume would include the cost of that new power. Uh, it would not have to be paid for by our existing rate payers, uh, but that's something that would uh, I, can, I, I know less than these two about future power supply, and it's, it's a considerable amount, and I could only speculate about where we could try to find it. All right. Um, this next question says, there are approximately 7.5 billion barrels of oil underneath the South China Sea, a region that China has aggressively laid claims to in recent years and says it, has, uh, says it historically has controlled. Uh, does anyone know if this is true? And... Would it not be cheaper and more efficient for China, Japan, India, et cetera, to extract these resources first? Well, I don't know if it's true. And, and I couldn't tell you what the economics of extracting that resource are. Um, so. I can tell you this. I mean, I don't know if it's true either, but seabed extraction is expensive and very capital intensive. Uh, and the West is a, a fly in cheap shale oil and natural gas. I mean, if I were China, I'd just go where the fuel is already, I mean, it's already here now. We can pull so much out of Canada. I would come here and get this fuel rather than extract that stuff. But I don't know anything about the economics. I don't know how much is down there. I really don't understand that stuff at all. But, um, I, but I do know, and I, I don't, we may disagree about the value judgment, but the fact of the matter is there's a ton of gas in the West, um, and it's not expensive. Whoever asked this question, do you have a follow-up to that? Go ahead. Hello. Wow, that's loud. Uh, I'm a high school student, and I go to Charles Wright Academy, and I've been taking an Asian history course this year about uh, modern Asia, and one of the books we read was called Asia's Cauldron, which is where we examined the South China Sea specifically. Um, I forget the author's name, but it was written in 2014, and he said that there are 7.5 billion barrels of oil, and there are also, I just looked it up, um, 225 billion tons of natural, or billion barrels of natural gas as well. So that was where my question came from. Probably 225 trillion cubic feet, my guess. Yeah. It's a lot. It's yeah. a lot. But so, I mean, one thing with, with I mean, sort of petroleum engineering in general, there are vast quantities of hydrocarbon fuels locked under the earth. And they exist in many, many regions. But the, there are sort of two ways of thinking about this in very simplistic terms. There's what we know is geologically there because of geological surveys and what we call sort of economically recoverable supplies. And those are two very different equations. And, and in the industry, they're debated quite extensively. And so there is generally some very small fraction of the total amount of stuff that's down there somewhere that we believe we can get at a reasonable price with current technology. And again, there's a, there's a lot of like fudge factor in that stuff, but e even if those numbers are true, just because there's a, there's a bunch of stuff down beneath the seafloor doesn't mean that there's any prospect of it coming up to the surface in the foreseeable future, unless things change radically, what they do, which they do sometimes in the energy industry. So, you know, I, I would just put a couple of cautionary notes on stuff like that. Um, we we don't like right now, for example. I mean, oil's what thirty bucks a barrel. I mean, it might be twenty five before you know the end of next month, um, it, depending on who you believe. At twenty five bucks a barrel, nobody is going to go into the South China Sea floor to get oil. Nobody. Um, it, it, we probably won't even be getting out of North Dakota. Well, we will be, but anyway, it, it just it gets complicated. So just to add a, a little flavor to Eric's great description of how you kind of calculate these things. So you remember my slide where I put up Northeast BC has 2,800 trillion cubic feet of gas in place, 
that's what's there. But there's 400 trillion cubic feet of it that really is producible with today's technologies and today's economics. So, you know, I don't know if, if the person who wrote the book was talking about 225 trillion cubic feet of gas in place, the ultimate resource, or the economic resource. Those are, as Eric said, two very different things. And I just reinforce Eric's point, uh, it's being produced pretty inexpensively, really inexpensively here. Uh, and so why would, why would any country spend the capital necessary to develop a, what's probably going to be a more expensive resource uh, when maybe they can utilize what's here? That's the global calculation really going on. Again, no value judgment on it. It's just that's the economics. I mean, I'll share my value judgment later on, but for now. <laughs> You've hinted at it. Um, Dan, what negative effect will it have if we stop the huge growth of natural gas production? And um, specifically, would it stay in the earth and be available for future generations? Yeah, you sure you don't want to ask Bob another question? No, uh, just kidding. It's coming later. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, so what, what's the negative impact of... If we stop the huge growth of natural gas production, right. would it stay in the earth and be available for future generations? Right. Well, what's, first of all, you got to understand there's a lot of it out there that we could produce with today's technology and today's economics. I mean, the conservative estimates are generations worth, right? Um, so if you want to go out seven generations, I don't know if there's seven generations worth uh, at today's price, but there is a lot, a lot of gas out there. So will it be available for future generations? I think what we have today would be av available for ge future generations. I think the negative impact, and it depends on who you're talking to, whether it's characterized as negative or positive, uh, if you're producing natural gas, it's a positive impact. If you, we slow the growth of production, prices are going to come up. So Eric, to just put a, <laughs> I don't know if I should do this, but to put a finer point on some of the things Eric said, I made a calculation a natural gas through the 80s and 90s, I took the average annual, the annual average spot price, cash price of natural gas, which you pay today for delivery tomorrow, for each of those years from 1981 to the year 2000, and plus it up to $2015. And the average across those 20 years was $4 a million BTU. In 2015, the price, the 2015 average price of natural gas was $2.62. And if you take the last five years, it was $3.50. So what's the point of that? The point is, as production slows, if demand stays the same and production slows, you begin to, you begin to uh, balance the market, which means prices come up, right? So uh, for the consumer, me heating my house with natural gas, it might mean I might mean I pay a little more uh, for my home heat and water heat. Uh, for the producer, it means they might not go bankrupt, which many of them are facing today uh, for, that, for that very reason. Now, you know, I, I don't want to make it sound awful if, if a producer, a, a natural gas producer, goes bankrupt. That doesn't mean the resource goes away. Uh, it just means somebody else is going to own it and decide whether to produce it. So will the resource, you know, if we, if we Lower production, of course, the resource will stay in the ground longer, but we already have generations of it. You've talked a lot about the economics of it and the technology. Um, what are some of the environmental implications of fracking natural gas? Well, that's an hour-long conversation that I could really get into. So, but let's talk about what some of the concerns are. Can we quickly just list yep, them? Yep. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna make it real quick. So there are really four basic concerns about. Uh, producing natural gas or oil from shale. They are water, 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 and air, okay? So it's how do we protect the groundwater? Uh, it's how, how much water are we using in the process? How do we dispose of the water when we can no longer use it? And what about air? Now, that's my succinct answer. There are concerns. Uh, I would love to share, to take some time to share with you how those concerns are being addressed, I think, by the industry. And by the way, I don't have any, any producer members, uh, but, but I think maybe if you have a follow-up question, I can 
answer quickly, but quickly, I, those are the concerns around environmental, concerns around hydraulic fracturing and horizontal directional drilling. Can I jump in? Uh, so that was a remarkable, it's a sink. that was awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, but there's, so in air, I don't know if you're including carbon emissions in that. It, okay, so to me, that's the most interesting one. I mean, and it so sort of goes back to the, the question that you answered a moment ago. It is, in my opinion, and there are differences of opinion about this, but our limits are not mostly about our ability to extract um, hydrocarbons for decades and decades, maybe centuries to come. We've got a lot of extractable oil and gas underground, particularly now that we know how to get it out of shale formations, which we're not doing in large parts of the world yet, but we could in the future. The limits are mostly about carbon emissions. The limits are mostly about, we, we can't do it for seven more generations or we're gonna be living in a very toasty and uncomfortable planet. And so on some level, the, the limits are going to be have to socially impose limits that we put on our production and combustion of this stuff in less dot, 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 depending on what kind of climate scenarios you believe. Um, so t to me, the right way to think about it isn't like, is there enough stuff underground that we could get up and burn? It's um, how much of it can we safely do before things get crazy? Sure. Three minutes, maybe? No, you can time 30 me. seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds. I don't know if I could do it in 30 seconds. But uh, so let's talk about one of those issues, methane emissions across the value chain from, from the wellhead produced all the way to your, your uh, burning in your furnace. And there's science around that, actually. Some of it's arguable. Some of it's pretty, pretty great. And I would cite one study. Uh, I hesitate to do this in a University of Washington campus building, but Washington State University actually led. I, I can't say that. <laughs> they led a study uh, studying the distribution system. So there's, these are the natural gas utilities and those pipelines that go underneath your streets. And they found that um, this is, was study was just published last fall, oh, May, a year ago, um, last fall commissioned by the Environmental Defense Fund. And they found with the distribution system that the EPA reporting of distribution system emissions of methane uh, was 36 to 70 percent higher than what they were estimate than what they found in their on the ground measurements. So if you then extract that back to the midstream, which is the pipelines and compression gathering systems, uh, their study said, gosh, it looks like maybe EPA's underestimating a little bit the emissions from that part of it. And if you go all the way to the production side, the study in essence said they're about right. EPA's estimates are about right. So all told, EPA is saying it's about one and a half percent of total natural gas produced and most, I think, reasonable scientists have come up and said, if it's more than 3%, we're at a wash with coal. Uh, so we're better, you know, it's better than coal today. So I just wanted to give you those facts. There's a lot of studies out there, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about them later. I think there's a follow-up question from the panel. Uh, so I, I actually mostly agree with that. I mean, so you, you can get to up estimates. There's one by a guy named Howarth that's up as high as 8%. Um, most of the studies, it seems like 3% ends up being this kind of magic number we talk about. But there are two kind of interesting factors that bear in the analytics of this stuff. Because it's not, so as it turns out, if you think about, just to make it as simple as possible, just for the, to make it just kind of comprehensible for a second. You think about a pipeline, right? And a pipeline's got various points along the way where theoretically small bits of methane could escape into the atmosphere. It turns out there aren't that many average pipelines. Most pipelines don't leak very much at all, or, or almost not at all. But then once in a while, you've got something that's a real problem, and you get a lot of leakage off that one, or you get some monstrosity like the Elisa Canyon in uh, the Los Angeles area. And then you've got a major problem. So the question is, well, how do you assess an average for a situation in which there's really not any piece of infrastructure that behaves like the average? So that's one of the big methodological complications for it. The second one is the way methane behaves in the atmosphere when it gets there. So we typically measure everything with respect to how it replicates or doesn't carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we use this 100-year-long sort of window for analysis. Now, on a 100-year-long window, methane from natural gas is about, I don't know, 30 times as potent as carbon dioxide. On a 20-year window, it's like 80 times as potent. So if your thought is, well, we want to assess the climate impacts of this over the next century, then we can, you come up with one set of, um, of beliefs about how um, risky natural gas production is. If your concern is, what is the potency over the next 20 years, then the picture gets a lot different. And that's, on some level, a philosophical assessment. On another level, I think there's a strong argument for assessing the, the impacts in the very near term, because there's so much anxiety about 
putting additional carbon into the atmosphere now. So those are just two of the sort of interesting things that get baked into this question. Uh, and then, but I, I do think, tend to think that probably the leak adjustments do belong more down in that like 3% range, and we can get into why later on, but probably not during this panel, maybe. 10 seconds. Just one, it's not really a response. It's Ten just seconds. adding a little more flavor to, to what Eric said, and that is this notion that uh, it's hard to take averages. It's true because uh, one example is the uh, midstream, the pipeline development, 45 measurements taken, uh, two of the measurements were emitting as much as all 43 of the others. So he's right, it might be hard to take averages, although you can take out the, fl the, the outliers and take a look at how the general system is. But the, I think the implication of that is we can find those and fix those. And that's what the industry needs to be doing. That's what we're supporting. So actually, that leads to one of my follow-up questions. You've talked a lot about how the cost is really low. And I think we've, we all know that the air, water, 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 environmental implications are, are pretty substantial and have a lot of cost to them. Um, so it seems like the cost of, the low cost of the product is not reflecting the cost that is born in the environment. Do you think the regulations have kept up with the technology that allows the big increase in extraction of natural gas? Um, do you think the economics are appropriately reflecting the costs? Well, it's a commodity, so it's traded a, as a commodity, and, and you know, it doesn't necessarily reflect all of the costs. But your, I think the more, more salient question is, is regulation kept up with it? And I would say, at the outset of the shale boom, whatever you want to call it, I sh actually, a natural gas guy should never use the word boom, um, the shale revolution. Uh, at the outset of it, I would say many of the states in which uh, shale was being developed were probably behind the eight ball in the regulatory fashion. Uh, but today, I think, uh, I think you're seeing them uh, put in robust and modern regulatory structures. I think of Pennsylvania, I think of Colorado, which, which just, just last year, two years ago, uh, put in probably the most robust regulatory structure around water and air regulation and the like. Uh, so I think uh, the answer to your question is today, the regular st regulatory structure is caught up initially it probably took a beating. I'm gonna add one more follow-up to that. Um, do we have a moral or ethical obligation to consider the environmental and community impacts of natural gas fracking? And I'm just gonna open that up to the panel. A moral or ethical obligation to consider? The community and environmental impacts of natural gas fracking. Well, I think your question assumes that producers and those communities aren't considering that, and I would suggest that they are. Uh, I'm going to answer that sort of half step removed from the actual question. Um, fracking actually gets picked on a lot, um, and as it should in a way, but you know, most forms of hydrocarbon extraction are really pretty bad. I mean, mountaintop mining is tough, strip mining for coal is tough. Seabed extraction of oil is tough. Like, even conventional oil drilling has a whole f bunch of things that are um, characteristic of it and problematic. You know, we pick on natural gas fracking. It's not great, in my opinion. We do have a moral and ethical obligation to consider those impacts, but those things apply to all of the ways that we get carbon fuels out of the ground and combust them. So um, I actually think we shouldn't overemphasize the role of fracking. The other stuff is, um, also got a whole nest of problems with it. But the, to the answer to the question, yes, absolutely. Otherwise, we're going to be in a whole heap of trouble. And we already are. You want to go for it? Well, I may have personal views on this, but I'm assigned here as an employee of the typical public utilities. We do not have a position on the moral uh, or ethical <laughs> views of fracking. I mean, I, I may have personal views, but it's not in my uh, it's not in my uh, portfolio to answer a question like that. You know, let me just offer. I, that's a that's we don't a, do it, wait, and we're not Mr. encouraging anyone. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought, I thought he was done. I'm sorry. We don't. We're, we're not in that business. So my, any opinion I have is sort of uh, it's it's not any more valid than anyone else's opinion who's not in the business. So I'm not going to share it. We have very limited time left, so I'm just going to move on to the next question. Uh, Mr. Mack, so Tacoma Power, is Tacoma Power required to expand power generation capacity to serve new large customers regardless of cost? Uh, 
Well, I believe that the state statute that applies to us requires us to obtain the facilities to provide power. We're an electric company. By the way, the statute defines company to include cities uh, and their utilities. And uh, the last part about at any cost, we um, are the policy about how we price the, sur the commodity we provide or the service is set by the Tacoma City Council uh, on a rate ordinance that we operate under now and which they revisit every year or two and by our board. And it suggests that for a large customer that the cost of service to that customer should be reflected in the rate and, and thereby probably not with the other customers. So. Uh, if, if it means at any cost to the customer requiring the service, I suppose the answer is probably yes. As to other people, I don't. I, I would suggest that at least in our past history, we have not passed those costs on to other customers. They, they it falls on the person asking for that service. But Perfect. but again, that is not my decision. That's a decision by the Tacoma City Council and the Tacoma Utility Board. For whomever. Whomever asked that question, did that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Um, what is the process for TPU to acquire so much new electricity, and how would they ensure it is from renewable resources? Sorry, what was the last part? How would they ensure it is from renewable resources, or renewable sources? Well, the policy for doing it is to, um, and again, this would be identified in the environmental review policy with whatever consultant the city retains and with the city, I suppose we would, we would have to do some due diligence about what supplies are available and, if, and how they would be um, sent to this region. Uh, and uh, Eric raised the issue, I think, in his presentation that may, you may, I think he raised it, or at least that's what I thought, was uh, that, may, that may involve diverting someone else's power to someone else who wants to pay higher for it. Uh, and the latter part of the question was, I'm sorry, I forgot. How would they ensure that it's from renewable sources? Well, so uh, I will answer this, and the audience may not like this. So uh, we would look at renewable resources, but renewable resources in the Northwest are primarily wind power and solar power and they're intermittent. People who say they have 100%, we have utilities say where we're 100% renewable, they aren't really. Because if the solar is not producing or the windmills aren't turning, they are purchasing other power, uh, either hydroelectric or gas. Or gas. And so, um, and the people in the industry call that shaping. So if, even if we were to acquire renewable, which we, our policies say we would look for, you would have to, I believe, find an equivalent amount of other power when the renewable power is not available, unless you want to uh, uh, open and close the plant periodically when the renewable isn't available. A lot of, I mean, I, I consider myself an environmentalist, but I want my laptop to work whether the, whether the wind is blowing in eastern Washington or not. And when it's not, then it kicks into another source, probably hydro or something else. So it gets a little more complicated. You almost have to buy what a layperson would think is a redundant supply to make sure you have an assured supply of power. I'm, I'm not using, all the engineers at Tacoma Power would be aghast at my answer because I'm not using, I'm, I'm using laypeople's terms. but. Uh, so uh, we would prefer renewable, but you'd have to look at something else to back that up with. Can I just add one thing to that too? So, and also, so wind and solar are intermittent, right? But uh, also hydropower is not produced at a uniform rate throughout the year because of the way that stream flows work. So there are times during the year when you, we're producing a lot of hydropower, and then there are times of the year we're producing not that much, and we tend to think about this sort of year, annual average, but that's actually not all that helpful. And so the point is, if you if you take on another 400 or 450 megawatts and go out and you're going to run that 365 days a year, even if hypothetically you found a whole bunch of new magic hydro that nobody knows about yet and started using that, you still couldn't use it all, the, all year long. You'd have to be backfilling it with something else. And I presume gas, but I don't, I mean, it could be something else, I suppose. 
I'm going to, they're all good questions. That's a good question, and it's going to, and the answer is going to be complicated if the environmental review is eventually resumed and addresses this. I don't think it's going to be a simple discussion. For whomever asked that question, okay, good. Time for two more questions? Two more. All right. Um, the facility has said that they, they had said last fall that they were going to use 10,000 gallons per minute, and then they said that they were going to use seven, uh, 7,200 gallons per minute, but there was no technical details to disclosed as to how they would do so. If whatever technology they're going to do uh, doesn't work, what then? Would Tacoma Public Utilities have to provide them the higher amount of water? Is this for water you're talking yes. about? I'm sorry, for water usage. Yeah. So I left out something here. Uh, <laughs> um, the questions and my answers presume that, the, that if the plan is located, that its water use would be 100% provided by Tacoma Water. And I hesitate to get into this because it'll sound like I'm taking sides, but I assume the environmental review would include, because uh, we, we had a proposal like this a few years ago, if the water is used for cooling, for example, whether there are alternatives, such as air cooling. Are there alternatives to use reused water? The city of Tacoma's and uh, environmental services utilities, I think, have at least informally st stated that they would like to have discussed whether reused water from wastewater treatment plants could be used. So uh, I'm kind of I'm not really answering the question directly, but it may not be that if, and if even if it were located, that 100% of the water supply would be that they are requesting would be necessary or that it would come from Tacoma Water. Uh, if they are a customer and we have the available water and even at the higher amount we have the available water during normal years, non-drought years, uh, if it was permitted to use that water, we would provide the water. What was the other environmental project that you referred to? You know, I forget, but there was a project, uh, I think I, that uh, maybe it wasn't in Tacoma, but in the Pacific Northwest where water was going to be used for cooling and there was a discussion about whether it should be cooled by air. And actually our rate policy suggests that you look at that sort of thing, whether, whether the Tacoma water, which is treated now uh, and uh, fluoridated and chlorinated, is necessary for the industrial use. So I'm, I, I assume that will all be looked at during the environmental review period. Uh, real quickly, so I, I, it's very difficult to even conduct a scoping exercise for a project like this. For the, it's very difficult for the public when we don't have access to basic information like this. Like they went from 10,000, at one point they were saying numbers even higher, or they implied that the numbers were even higher than that. Uh, then it was down to 7,200, but there's no explanation at all. And so the, these are very serious questions that bear a lot on Tacoma ratepayers and the environment and blah, blah, blah. But you know, I, I think it's not, it's not sort of a, from a, just a public policy perspective, a fair exercise to ask the public to weigh in with scoping comments on something where it feels like they're just inventing numbers and then when you push them for answers, there's nothing there. Um, so, you know, and I've worked on a bunch of these, you know, sort of big, you know, energy and petrochemical projects. I've looked at a bunch of them and even for relatively simple projects like a rail loop with a pile of coal, there's a lot more detail that we typically have at this stage or we, you know, now they've pulled back, but we typically have access to a lot more detail, a lot more explanation from the project backers about what exactly they're looking to do. And so that's an exercise where you can sort of engage on the facts in a, in a really robust way. But this kind of process that Innovation Works has been backing, I think is, um, you know, leaving aside the environmental considerations or anything else, just from a public policy perspective, is really, uh, it, it's just, it seems really awkward and unfair. All right, the last question, and it's kind of a twofer. Um, as we think about the methanol project and whether it's good or bad for Tacoma, shouldn't we think about the overall bigger question about what kind of future we want, given the need to keep fossil fuels in the ground if we are to survive climate change? Do you agree with this? And where do you think this plays into the decision-making process? I stumped them all. This is well, my stump speech, go ahead. If that's uh, if I'm allowed to answer, I'm going to sound. Um, I don't want to sound amoral on the subject, but um, 
These are good questions, but as far as a public utility that has state-issued rights, which we're, we're required under, not just the statutes I cited, but the Growth Management Act and all sorts of other things to supply customers within the urban area who have, been, who have permitted uses, we really do not look beyond the permitted use. I mean, we are providing water and power to marijuana grow operations that we've had a board member morally object to, but we're required to provide it, even though the federal law says we can't, but the state law says we have to. So that's, that's an important issue and should be addressed in the process, but it's not one we're gonna take a position on. That's not within our scope of duties. But it is well within the scope of duties of the citizens and the voters who support the, you know, the public port and the city that provides the zoning. So from the perspective of the citizenry, it's absolutely in our moral purview to make decisions about whether or not we morally approve of projects like this. I think that's a completely appropriate debate to have. Um, it's my judgment, and lots of folks disagree with me, that we have pretty much all of the fossil fuel infrastructure that we need, and what we need is less of it, not more of it. So one of the things that I've been trying to do with myself over the last couple of years is to prevent us from building um, large-scale new pieces of fossil infrastructure. Uh, and I, to me, you know, although there are many unanswered questions and many complexities that should be sorted out because the stuff is not straightforward all the time, um, this is an example of an investment uh, that will be with us for decades um, that probably increases carbon emissions and probably makes the, the problem worse. So um, absent new information to correct that, uh, I would suggest that the moral obligation is um, to prevent these kinds of projects from getting built. But um, that's just my opinion. And where do you think that comes to play in the process? Where is that in the decision-making process? Well, because uh, the decision makers are all uh, ultimately uh, elected bodies or public bodies, uh, I would say that the, the, um, the decision-making should flow up from the people, from the voters, uh, from the citizens themselves, um, so that the port uh, rescinds or unwinds the lease, so that the city rezones the parcels of land to prevent it, uh, so that state agency decision-makers um, deny permits for these projects. Uh, it's the same sort of thing uh, in Tacoma's context that I recommend for coal export projects, um, for oil by rail projects, and all the rest of them. Um, not that there aren't complexities, because there are, um, but given what we know now, um, that's, that's my recommendation. All right. Uh, thank you very much, each of you. Bob Mack, thank you very, very much. Um, Even though you think I talked too long at the first question. Um, I especially thank everyone here for the great questions. Again, feel free to email me with uh, ways that we can improve this in the future. Thank you so much.